Well, good morning, Harbor Creek Community Church. I wish I could say it's great to see you, but of course I cannot. We've got another Sunday that we are separated physically. I remind you often that we are still connected spiritually. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, and there's nothing that can separate the body of Christ from each other. Remember that. Having said that, there are a couple of opportunities that we have during the week that I want to remind you about that we can connect visually. Uh, one in particular is the Wednesday night that all three churches uh, get together for a prayer time. Uh, it is a great time. If you haven't taken advantage of that yet, I really encourage you to do that. We get to see everybody's face. Uh, we get to talk to one another. We get to pray for one another. It, it's, it's just a good time. Uh, and then the uh, second time is on Thursday night. Uh, I send a personal email out, and there's a link, a Zoom link, uh, that uh, the Harbor Creek Community Church community group, it's open to everyone. Another great opportunity for all of us at Harbor Creek to come together, see each other, talk to each other, share life, and uh, have a, a, a short uh, devotion, if you will, a discussion of the message. So those are two opportunities. I do want to remind you as well, maybe you've already seen this, those of you who have Facebook accounts, there's a couple things that we encourage you to do. One is to take a, a short video of yourself, um, a, a one minute, no more than two minute video, and it would be a, a short testimony of how Jesus changed your life. And then uh, hashtag that on your uh, Facebook posting, hashtag Jesus changed my life. We're wanting all three churches to do that, and then uh, we're going to put all of this together. You'll see it's going to be a great uh, exposure uh, from the three churches on Facebook. There's a, another opportunity, and it's called uh, Dressed and Blessed. So we're wanting you to take a picture of yourself. You could do that now, as soon as uh, this is over and before you begin uh, the worship service. But take a picture of yourself, and uh, you're going to be dressed uh, for uh, Sunday uh, to be blessed by uh, God's presence in your life. Would you do that as well? And the hashtag for that is dressed and blessed. So in just a few moments, there's going to be a song, a couple, sing along, and then a message is coming. Uh, this is the Sunday that we're celebrating the resurrected Christ. So God bless you and know that, G, uh, that uh, Sherry and I miss you tremendously. God bless. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Gil, and I am the praise leader here at Mill Creek Community Church. And you're probably hearing a lot of different voices, so we just wanted to put some faces to those voices that you're hearing. So if you would, just please join with us this morning as we sing to our risen Savior. Day. We're gathered in your name, we're calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire to burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Now, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. Heart, filling every part of our 
your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. And all my failures I try to hide. It was my doom till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. Oh, what a day when you called my name. And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Darkness 
tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. Beginning at the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me. My name is Tim Bates. I'm on the elder team here at Mill Creek Community Church, and we're thankful that you can all be together with us worshiping from the three churches, Mill Creek, Harbor Creek Community Church, and Edinburgh Community Church. I'll be reading this morning from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 49, if you'd like to turn there and follow along. This is after Jesus has resurrected and before he ascends into heaven, and these are some of his last words to his disciples on earth, so very important. Again, uh, starting in verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity for us to be able to worship together. I thank you for what Easter Sunday means. I thank you for what your resurrection means to all who have put their faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray that you would work through the pastors delivering the sermons today. I pray that this would be a message that would touch people. I pray, Lord, you would draw people to yourself through it. And Lord, I just ask uh, during this time of uncertainty with the virus that you would just 
proclaim that we would be the light and salt that we are supposed to be to the community. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, Harbor Creek Community Church, I look forward to bringing you this message on this, uh, this wonderful Sunday of celebrating the empty tomb. I encourage you to open your Bibles to the 24th chapter of Luke and the message uh, this morning, the title is Trusting in the Risen Christ. Uh, Tim Bates, uh, an elder from MCC, read the scripture and, and he prayed, as you well know, and I, I want to get right into the scriptures. I'm with my eyes open. I'm praying that God will use me for his glory. Christ's name will be exalted. The Holy Spirit will use me, guide my thoughts, my thinking. Uh, my presentation to you, I pray, is one that brings encouragement as well as conviction. Uh, God bless uh, the reading of his word, and I pray now the exposition of it. So let's look at Luke 24. And uh, again, I'm not going to uh, take the time this morning, of course, to reread what Tim read, but I do want uh, to emphasize certain things. You know, this is a time that we want to try to keep life simple, just as simple as we possibly can. There's a lot of, uh, well, there's a lot of pressure that's going on, isn't there? A lot of tension in the home. So something simplistic as we live out our day now is a good thing. Well, it's not always a good thing, though. Sometimes something simple can be very dangerous. I read recently a certain passwords that people use uh, for uh, applications, uh, even uh, instruments that they have that they want to keep secure, uh, but there's passwords that have to be assigned to them. And so here's a couple of the samplings I read. This is the top 20 list. Uh, and, and in that top 20 list, one is um, the password ready, one, two, three, four, five. That, that, that's pretty brilliant, isn't it? Uh, and then to that, I heard uh, it, within that top 20 is one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so it just keeps getting a little more astounding. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And, and that's all in the, the top 20 uh, of, of the uh, password list. And, and then to just get a change of pace, uh, there's, um, ready for this? There's a password one, 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 one. There, there's some real brilliance to that, isn't there? And, and in, in that top 20, the, the second most dangerous password was the word password. Can you believe it? Just, uh, you know, my password that's going to keep everything secure is the word password. And then there's others. There's like uh, coyote and there's giraffe and there's all kinds of animals that people use for their passwords. And, and then there's, there's using their own name. It's, it's like, okay, my password that I'm going to use that's going to really keep everything secure, it's going to be my own name, Jim. <laughs> that's just so amazing when I read that list. But it did remind me, it did remind me that even more dangerous is trying to use our own word as the password that unlocks, if you will, entry into the presence of God, to use my own name as a password to get into heaven, as if I can rely on my own efforts and my own accomplishments to, to, to be in God's presence. So this morning, what I'm really wanting to emphasize is trusting in the risen Christ, trusting in the, the name of Jesus Christ, that's the key, isn't it? That's the key. It's the name of Jesus Christ. It's the name that's above all names. It's the name of, of, of the one who went to the cross to die for man's sins, to die for my sins. It's the, the name of the one who bore the wrath of God as the punishment for our sins. It's a, the name of the one who was buried on that third day as they took him from the cross and put him in the tomb. But it's the one that arose on the third day in a, in a physical, glorious, heavenward bound body. And then we know he ascended back into the heavens from which he came. And that's his name. His name is Jesus Christ. And in and, and John 1, he says this, he says, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in what? In his name. Isn't that wonderful? Trusting in the risen cross, Christ. We can trust 
in the risen Christ. When you receive Christ into your life, you receive at least at least four attributes that we can trust in, and they're yours and, and they're, they're mine. And they are, this morning in your, uh, uh, in your uh, application, your church app, uh, you'll see that the note sheet, and, and it's his peace, and it's his joy, and it's his accomplishment, and, and it's his power. And, and, and it, the power that comes from the indwelling spirit. So those are the, the four attributes that I want to touch on this morning that's, that we see uncovered in our, our text. So let's look at that first attribute. The first attribute is his peace, his peace. Look at that in verses 36 and 40. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. And it says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace be to you, or peace to you. But verse 37, but they were startled and they were frightened and they thought they saw a spirit. What's happening here? Well, there's a lot of exciting things that had just happened and, 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 and even some things that were very unexplained that were happening. And so they were coming together, the, the apostles and, and some of the other believers, and they were meeting in a room and they were coming to, to share what they had witnessed. And they just wanted to, to tell that to each other, to try to, to try to gain some strength from it, to try to get some, some, some explanation to what, what's, what's happened in the last few days. And the apostle Paul wrote, he said that in the first day of the week, in the evening, the disciples all huddled together in fear behind locked doors, and Jesus himself appeared in the room, and, and the doors were shut. The doors were shut, and then all of a sudden, there was Jesus standing before them. You, you would have expected, I would have at that moment, that, that there would be like a, 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 a huge sigh of relief. They, they got their eyes on him now, or, or maybe they would just break out in a song. Wouldn't you just sing, start singing Hosanna, Hosanna, or, or praise to his name, but that's that's not the emotion. That's not what the scriptures tell us. What happens is they were, they were terrified. They, they, were, they were frightened. Uh, they, they, they felt troubled. And so that all came about because of what they saw, what they thought they saw. You see, what they thought they saw was a ghost. What they saw was a spirit. They, they, didn't, they didn't connect that they were looking at flesh and blood. They were looking at Jesus in his resurrected body. It just, it just happened so suddenly, and they were so, so totally unprepared that even though several of them had already seen the risen Christ, it just didn't connect. The dots didn't connect. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus did what he still do, through, does through the indwelling spirit in your life and my life. He sought to bring calm to them. He tried to settle them down. And the first thing we see in the Scriptures is that he gave them a blessing. He says, peace be with you. In fact, in the Gospel of John, he says it two times, peace be with you, and then says it again, peace be with you, as if they hadn't heard it or as if they hadn't received it. You see, the, the God of peace had raised Jesus from the dead. Think of that, the God of peace raised Jesus from the dead, and there was, there was just nothing for them to fear. But because of his sacrifice on the cross, men and women could now have peace with God. And that was the message that he was bringing to them. This is what Paul says in Romans 5.1. It's not on the PowerPoint, but I want you to hear this. Listen to this. Romans 5.1, he says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that, church? Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the peace that Christ offers. That's the peace that comes from knowing and trusting in the risen Jesus Christ. Peace from the frustrations, if you will, of trying to do something to earn peace with God. As if, again, I can stand before God and based upon my name or my accomplishments, I'm going to be at peace with him. That's not the peace that Jesus is offering. You know, in South Korea, they actually pay 
to receive peace. There's a picture on a PowerPoint beside of me here. This is a young lady in South Korea, and what they do is they've created a, um, uh, a domain of some sort where you can actually pay dollars and, and go to this place, and you have a, a cell. It's actually called a prison, and, and you go there, and you have a, a, a cell, and there's a mat in there, and you're, you have solitary, and you do these things because you want to be alone. You want to have peace. And, and then the next picture, we, we see this person, they've spent their time and they're graduating. They're actually getting a certificate here that they can have peace. You see, in, in South Korea, there's some people that work 80 to 100 hours and the stress of life is just more than they can bear. And so they actually pay to find peace. Well, that's not what Jesus said in John 14, 27. He says, Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Don't, don't try to find peace in the world, Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that he's the peacemaker. He's the peace offering. And so the first attribute that we see that we can trust in the risen Christ is, is his peace. The second attribute from trusting in the risen Christ is his joy. In verses 41 and 43, we see the joy that he's talking about. And he says in 41, And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Isn't that interesting? It's an odd response that they gave as they saw Jesus. It said that they, they still disbelieved. For joy. You know, another way of saying that is they, they did not believe for joy. Even though they were seeing him, they had their eyes feasted on him, they didn't believe. They, they just didn't connect. They weren't trusting in what they were seeing. It was just like it was, like it was, it was too good to be true. It was too good to be true. So it, it's the same feeling that, that Jacob had when, when he got the news that Joseph was alive. It was just like it was too good to be true. It, it, it's the same feeling that the nation of Israel experienced when, when they were rescued from their bondage in Egypt. It was just like it was too good to be true. They were free. The, the joy wasn't there. But Jesus had told his disciples that they would rejoice when they saw him again. In, in John 16, he says, I'll see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And, and so you see, now that promise is fulfilled. The, 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 the joy of seeing him, the joy of experiencing to be in his presence was now theirs if they would, if they would only believe John Piper gives a great definition of joy. He says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul. It's produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. I love uh, that definition from, from Piper. He goes on to say that Christian joy is a good feeling. By, by, by that, he says, I, I mean it's not an idea, it's not a conviction, it's not a persuasion, or it's not a decision, it's a feeling. Or, or he says, I, I use words interchangeably here, it's an emotion, it's an emotion. And, and, and that emotion, that, that feeling, it, it goes to the soul, the very inner core of your being. Do you hear me, church? It, it, it's, it's, it's deep in the, in the seat of your emotions. That's the joy that we receive when we trust in the risen Christ. Now, now your body, it, it demonstrates joy in, 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 in different ways. It, it could be just this, this, this funny feeling in your stomach. It's a, something just comes over you, the, the joy, the happiness of a life experience. In fact, you, you might even have tears of joy. You've heard that, and maybe you've even experienced that, tears of joy falling down your face. But that's, that's not in itself joy. You see, Piper further explains this this way. Let me read. 
The body is chemicals, muscles, and nerves. It's made up of electrons, atoms, and molecules. And when those molecules move, it's not a moral event, meaning the body doesn't have right and wrong. A movement of my arm back and forth has no moral significance until I tell it, till I tell it by my will or my emotion to punch somebody. You see, then it becomes bad. Or I, or I hug somebody if, if, the, if needed, then it becomes good. My, my soul imparts virtue, virtue right or wrong to the physical parts of my life. And the Bible clearly says, Piper writes, it's right to feel joy in God. You know, there's many life experiences that I could really put out there for you to help you be reminded of what it means to experience joy, a joy that's really in the core existence. One of those, I think for me, it's ice cream. Here we have a kid licking the ice cream. It's on the cone. I've told you before, my favorite ice cream is cherry nut ice cream, and, and it doesn't have to be that. I mean, just a bowl of ice cream. Sometimes Sherry will just bless me in the evening, and she'll come and surprise me with a, a bowl of ice cream because she knows how much I love ice cream. It's just like it, well, it just gives me joy. But you know there's something even more to that, and that's when you get that ice cream, and you see it's got more things on it. It's got, it's got things that, uh, that makes it even more attractive or even more delicious, and it starts dripping down your hands. There's a, an overflow to that joy, isn't there? You see? Well, this is what Jesus said. This is the New Living Translation. But, oh, I'm sorry, I want to talk about there's a different joy. Thank you. Sorry about that. There's another joy that I want to share with you, and that, that joy comes from, from serving. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of a pastor in China, or a, a person in China, not a pastor, but a person in China, but a Christian. And uh, this is a, a, a scene of a sewer. Uh, this is a, where human uh, uh, feces is, is deposited. This is, this is where people went to the bathroom. And, and, and he cleaned these. Now, let me explain. What happened was he wanted to have the joy of being in the presence of God. He wanted to be in, in the presence alone. He wanted to be able to read the scriptures out loud. He wanted to be able to pray alone. But he couldn't do that because he was in a, a community of other prisoners. And so he kept praying to God that if he could just create a way that he could be alone so that he could have the joy of being in his presence. And, and so one day, unbeknownst to him, he's uh, assigned to this detail. And uh, it's a detail that kept everybody away from him because of the smell of it. They just, nobody wanted to be around him. Even the prison guards didn't want to be around him. And so he, at one time, he just kind of felt down about it. And he had this terrible job that he had to do. But he began singing. And, and, and he began reciting uh, scripture from memory. And then it dawned on him, this was the very thing that he had been asking God for, to have some time alone that he could do these things, and he just filled up with joy. That, that's what I wanted you to see here, is that there's different ways, different pictures that we can have about what it means to experience the joy of the trust in trusting into the, the risen Christ. Now I want to share you John 15 in the New Living Translation. Jesus said, I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. That's the joy that comes from trusting in the risen Christ, the joy that's not just temporary. It just keeps coming and it bubbles up and it overflows and it touches the people around us. Paul wrote about it in his own prison in 2 Corinthians, as he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, I'm filled with comfort in all our affliction. I'm, over, I'm overflowing with joy. He's overflowing with joy in his life circumstances. And how could he say that? It's because that he had this trust in the risen Christ. He knew what it meant to have the joy that really surpasses all understanding, as he wrote about later. The, the third attribute, attribute that I want to share with you this morning is his accomplishments. His accomplishments. We, we get to have his accomplishments because of our trusting in the risen Christ. Uh, his accomplishments. This, this is what Jesus said. This, this kind of just nails it. What did he accomplish? So in John 19.30, 
Jesus simply said, it is finished. It's one of seven things that he said on the cross that day that he hung on that cross. It is, it is finished. What did he mean by that? Did he mean that the pain and the suffering is now a finished? Is that, was that what he accomplished? Was just that he was going to suffer and, and he was going to be in pain from the nails in his hands and in his feet? Was that what was finished? What, 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 what was it? Well, well, it was more than that. It, it was more than that. You see, it, it, it's a word that he was using to say it's paid in full. It's paid in full. It's finished. Nothing else is needed to be accomplished. He's done it all. The, the sin separation that was between you and me and God, that's now over when we trust in the risen Christ. That, that, that accomplishment in itself brings peace and brings joy. It, it's, it's, the, it's the perfect, unblemished lamb that sacrificed himself, offered himself up uh, to God. And, and, and so the perpetuation for our sins, he was, the, he was the ultimate sacrifice, and that was his accomplishment. And in and, and Luke 24, uh, Jesus said, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that prophets and that have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Wasn't it necessary? Wasn't the accomplishment that, that Jesus uh, completed on the cross, what he's saying, you, you foolish uh, people, you're, you're, you're not believing, and, and you heard from the beginning the prophets and, 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 and all, that was, all that was taught, all that was said, it all pointed to what he accomplished on the cross. Uh, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, he says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. That's what he accomplished, and it was all for our sake, to bring God glory for sure. But it was for our sake. God made him to be my sin, your sin. That's what he accomplished in exchange for that, by trusting in the risen Christ, we become the righteousness of God. That's what pulls us together. We're no longer separated. We're no longer hostile with God when we trust in the risen Christ. Well, you see, with their, their fears now relieved, Jesus begins to teach them. And, and look what he says in verse 44. He said, uh, there uh, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. What Jesus had said to the two men earlier on the road to Emmaus, he's now repeating to this larger group that he has, his, his disciples. He, he's telling them that he was, he was mentioned in Moses and the prophets and, and even in the Psalms. He's, he's showing them that the whole Old Testament, it, it, it's, it's the fulfillment of that, it, that, that what he has done and who he is was all in the Old Testament and what he's accomplished it's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so in verse 45, it says, Jesus uh, said he, he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. And verses 46 and 47, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and, the, and, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in the name of all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. What Jesus is saying, it was written. What he accomplished, it was, it was written. It, it, it was all in the Old Testament. You see, according to Jesus, the basic message of the, message of the Old Testament really had two main points, and that's what he's pointing out to them. And that was that the, that the Christ would suffer, and that he would rise on the third day, and that repentance and, and forgiveness would be proclaimed not only in Jerusalem, but to all the nations. That's what Jesus is pointing out to them, that he has accomplished that. That's what he's accomplished. That's the basic story of the Scripture. 
that, that, that it centers on the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that, that it's an announcement to, of, of, the, of the good news to the nations, and, and that it's a call for all people to, to turn from their sins and, and turn to the living Christ, to, to trust in Him. Everything, my friends, from Genesis to Revelation relates in some way to that basic message. To, to what he would accomplish, to, to, to who he is, who he is uh, to you and who he is to me. Uh, and, and, and so are you, are you trusting in the risen Christ? Is that you? Because you see, Jesus, Jesus is the name that's above all names. Jesus didn't leave his disciples on their own, though. He, he said that they were to be witnesses. They were to go out and to proclaim this good news. But they weren't to do that by themselves. They were to do that with the power. He was going to send them the Holy Spirit. And so the fourth attribute and the last <clears throat> that I want to share with you this morning is we, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we trust in the risen Christ. Look at verse 49, and he says, And behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, from power on high. The indwelling Holy Spirit is received to the believer, the one trusting in the risen Christ. Here's a, a video, a short video. It's simplistic, but watch this and you'll get a, some understanding. <music> As I said, that's very simplistic in its presentation to us about the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, but, but it helps us understand what has happened to uh, the believer. The indwelling Spirit gives us the power. It transforms our life. It, it brings that joy in my soul, the inner being of who I am, and it, it overflows towards God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does His work. It's not some magical stirring up uh, uh, that happens. It's not, it's not caused uh, by something that I do, but the Spirit Himself is the one who gives us the, the ability to be able to see Christ in the Scriptures and to see Christ in each other as we see the transformation in our lives. That's all the work of the Holy Spirit. What we see in each other's lives is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 3. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what we see in each other's lives, the power of the indwelling Spirit changing us, transforming, uh, transforming us, all because we're trusting in the risen Christ. And that's why we can say, as Paul says, he says in, in Philippians, he says, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. This is the day, guys. This is the day. This is the day that we rejoice in the Lord because he's alive. He's not dead. He's not in a tomb. The tomb is empty. He's alive. The question then begs to be asked, how do you rejoice in the Lord? How do you rejoice in the Lord? How do you rejoice in the Lord and, and, and not see the things that the Lord causes that joy to rise up into your heart? Do you experience that? Do, do you have the experience of the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life? You see, that's the power that comes from trusting in the risen Christ. He's alive. That's our declaration today, is it not, church? He's alive. The question that begs to be asked of you, and, and, I, and I'm asking myself, do I truly trust in the risen Christ? That's the message that we proclaim to our family and our friends, all who come. God's plan 
unfolding in your life and in my life. That's what we're going to be talking about as we soon get ready next week to start in our new series of freedom. We're going to be talking about the freedom that Israel experienced when they were rescued from the domain of their darkness being in bondage. We talk today about how we're being rescued from the domain of darkness, that sin that separates us from a holy and righteous God. It's trusting in the risen Christ. We're going to be able to go into uh, the Freedom Series that starts next uh, Sunday, and I pray that you will be a part of that experience as well. I, I'm just grateful to have had, had this opportunity to share with you this morning, and I want to pray for us, and then I have uh, the last thing we're going to share is a video that I want you to see. Let me talk about that in just a little bit, but let me pray for you right now. Father, I'm grateful again for an experience to be able to stand behind this pulpit and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. What a great day this is. Even as we find ourselves isolated in our homes, not able to meet together as a church physically, we're, we're, we're reminded again that there's nothing that separates us from you. Not, nothing can separate us from your love. And that, that the body of Christ worships together in spirit and in truth. I pray we've done that this morning. I pray those who have watched this, uh, this message or listening to this message, I pray that resonates deep in their heart. We celebrate today the empty tomb. This is the day. This, this is what separates Christianity, someone that's authentic and they're trusting in the risen Christ. This separates us from all of the other religions in the world. You see, Father, we're convinced that our life experience with you is not a religion, it's a personal experience, it's a personal relationship. So thank you, thank you for your great love that has rescued us from ourselves and has brought us together with you that we can spend not only today but eternity in your presence because of our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Well, my friends, I'm going to introduce uh, to you a video that I want you to watch. It's a short video, but it's of Peter's testimony after he had seen the risen Christ. I want you to watch it, and I ask you that after you watch it, spend some time discussing it. Ask each other some questions in your family, or maybe if you're single at home, call someone, uh, and, and just start discussing the message. Uh, spend today uh, not just now, but the rest of the day, celebrating the empty tomb. Watch this video, and God's blessings on you. Right here. This is where Jesus was kneeling when they uh, came and grabbed him. Um, and I, I, I came in from this direction with my sword drawn and I cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. I reacted exactly the way Jesus told us not to. And Jesus. He picks up that man's ear. And he... Puts it right on his head, like it had always been there. But that's what he did. Jesus was always fixing people's messes. <laughs> you know, um, I said I didn't know him that night. Three times. Three times. I denied my friend. He told me I was going to do it. Before I even did it. And like an idiot, I argued with him. <laughs> but he was right. He's always right. He told us he was going to die 
before he died. But you know what he did? You know what he did when he came back to life? <laughs> that morning when he came back to life, he gave me the opportunity to tell him I loved him. greatest regret but that's how he does it when it settles here it changes here and that turns the past upside down it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what happened that night because of what happened that morning because he beat death. Death. He is alive. <laughs> alive!